Hello, and welcome to our talk, um, Attacking the Linux Kernel, Exploit Engineering. So just a quick introduction to, our, to us. We're basically the um, Exploit Development Group at NCC. So my team is, is responsible for um, developing exploits used for uh, consultants on engagements to help them achieve their objectives. We're also doing a lot of like public research, publications, and security research and um, doing competitions like Pwn to Own and just general hacking competitions. Um, so there's, and there's three of us, it's myself, uh, uh, Cedric Holbrand and Aaron who's not here. So the aim of this talk, it's basically, it's not just about one specific kernel vulnerability. We want to talk more about the, the processes and uh, tooling and techniques and so on around like developing a Linux kernel exploit. We don't just want to like deep dive into one specific bug, but we are going to give examples, like practical examples from the, uh, from the bugs which we found. The, we're going to talk about the challenges going beyond a proof of concept exploit because um, like proof of concept exploits maybe only work for one, arch one system uh, and one target, but we need something which is scalable across lots of different environments. And then finally, we're going to release our tools, uh, libslub, which is used for Linux kernel um, slub allocator analysis and understanding. So the talk, it's going to be structured like this. We're going to first talk about um, the vulnerabilities which we found, how we found the vulnerabilities, and how we triaged them. And then we're going to talk, uh, Cedric's going to talk about the one specific vulnerability which we found, so we can give practical examples of the, of the techniques and tooling. Um, the tools we developed, and then finally reliability and scalability, because reliability and scalability is a, an important um, part of exploit development, which people don't really talk about that much. So the vulnerability um, identification, what we did um, this time around was, well, this is how we went about finding vulnerabilities within the Linux kernel. We, we, we were think, taking the approach that probably the core operating system functionality, things like the scheduler, the interrupts, uh, the memory mapping subsystems and things like that, they're probably less interesting uh, to, to us to find bugs. But things like the, the file system, the networking stack, the socket layer, um, are, are all like attack surfaces which are exposed from a, from a Linux like privilege escalation perspective. And things like new components as well, like IOU ring, um, like it's been introduced into the kernel relatively recently uh, and um, is subject to quite a lot of changes. And it, in the past, we've had things like BPF because there's um, a BPF packet filtering interpreter within the kernel. That was obviously an interesting thing to look at. But actually these days, um, BPF isn't that interesting because, uh, well, at least in Ubuntu, um, which we were focusing on, uh, unprivileged BPF disable is disabled. Um, so where, where do you look? Well, Google have done a really good thing with, um, with their KCTF project. So if you're not aware of uh, KCTF, it's basically it's a Kubernetes CTF challenge where people have to break outside of the Kubernetes containers and the pods um, to, to gain code execution within the node um, and obtain a flag. So typically this is done using Linux kernel uh, privesks. So the, if, if you look at the vulnerabilities which have actually been practically exploited in KCTF, you can see um, from this list there's lots and lots of there's a, a bunch of different examples, but things like like C group, the um, net packet subsystem, IOU ring, as we we're saying, like there's been a lot of like practical ex exploits within IOU ring because it was a subject uh, because that subsystem was subject to change quite a lot. Um, but yeah, Google have basically came up with these these recipes, and these are like recipes which go which uh, are used for, for exploit development. So essentially, the bug classes, the primitives which go into into developing the exploit, and the capabilities which are required to exploit these bugs. So um, one area which we looked at quite a, one area which we were interested in investigating was this uh, user namespaces. So if you're not familiar with user namespaces in Linux, uh, it's a way of providing segregation and like, grouping of resources uh, so they're only uh, accessible within, within that namespace. 
But, uh, and it's the way which um, containerization is, is like the primitives in the kernel which containerization is built on. So things like um, you have IPC namespaces, mount namespaces, network namespaces. But it's interesting from an attacker perspective because um, these namespaces, while they do, they are there to provide isolation and, and grouping of resources, they actually expose more kernel attack surface to, um, to a process which is executing within a namespace. So on a, Ubuntu as well, um, they've got this uh, unprivileged user namespace is, is enabled. So an unprivileged user can create these namespaces and processes can gain these capabilities which they wouldn't uh, particularly be able to have, well, they wouldn't be able to have as unprivileged if they're outside of the namespace, but within the container, they can actually hold the, um, the, the capabilities. So if we look at the network namespace to start off with, then basically there's, um, we, we started doing a code review of the different uh, areas which are exposed within the network namespace. And this basically gives you the capabilities to, to use things like the net filter subsystem, open vSwitch, and WireGuard. Um, there's also a bunch of like different networking devices which are exposed, and we could find bugs within, the, um, within these networking devices and, and different uh, uh, interfaces which are supported and can be instantiated within the network namespace. We've also got this um, notion of a mount namespace. So a mount namespace allows um, allows file systems to be mounted within the within a user mount namespace. So typically, an unprivileged an unprivileged user wouldn't be able to mount um, file systems, but within a mount namespace, they they are able to mount certain um, file systems. And a previous year's pwn to own bug, which was found by Synactive, uh, a use after free in the shift FS. Um, file system was, was uh, used for point to own. Um, so we did a, a code review of all the different um, um, file systems which are accessible within the mount namespace as well. So we, t we took all this information when we were doing this code review and we fed this into developing our uh, internal version of syscaller. Um, we, 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 brought, we forked syscaller and we basically extended the grammars for, for syscaller. And we, we made sure that we were focusing on fuzzing of um, the subsystems which were uh, exposed within Ubuntu. And um, because when Google are fuzzing at scale, they're, they're essentially fuzzing on the master branch. They're, they're fuzzing quite wide, but they're, they're not fuzzing like distro specific functionality. So things like shift of S isn't covered. Um, we took the coverage maps. So we were looking at syscaller to basically identify where gaps were in the coverage. We looked at change logs. We worked out where our way backwards through the um, kernel change logs from the, old, from the newer versions to the older versions and, and added and extended the grammars for this. Uh, Zeri's written two really good articles, uh, two really good blog articles about um, how you extend syscall grammars because I don't have time to go into it here, but um, he wrote some things about external network fuzzing and USB fuzzing, uh, extending the grammars for this. Then we, then we also did a targeted um, functionality fuzzing. So with all this information which we gathered, we, we decided to focus on, the, on, on a number of areas. So we focused on the NetFilter subsystem because NetFilter was, um, it wasn't previously exposed. I mean, it's not exposed to an unprivileged user, but inside a network namespace it is. We focused on the packet scheduler because when we were reviewing the code, it looked like it wasn't uh, particularly as high a quality code as it could be. And we focused on uh, OVS, open vSwitch, because there were literally no public grammars for, uh, for open vSwitch. So then we, went, we took a Threadripper box with 64 cores. We could have used um, some cloud-based fuzzing for this. And we basically, we, we, we threw this again with 28 VMs for, for uh, like a couple of weeks at a time, just focusing down on these, on these specific areas of functionality rather than going wide across the kernel. And we tried to do things like porting the ASM1 parser from kernel space. We moved that back from kernel space into userland so we could fuzz that with libfuzzer as well. 
And I believe Ahmad's talking about um, ASN01 and like possible weaknesses in that later on as well. Um, so the, the, I'm now going to talk about the vulnerability triage and, and what we actually found from this. So to triage the, these, these, um, these fuzzed vulnerabilities, we basically, I mean, it, it's quite time consuming. We, we didn't really have an automated way of triaging these issues. Like on Windows, you have things like, like buying exploitable, it gives you kind of an indication, but um, we were basically just relying on our experience and knowledge like, of, of what could be an interesting crash. Um, but obviously focusing on things like which triggered KASAN, so issues which were very likely to be memory safety violations. And then we basically filed these bugs into a bug tracker. So because we had quite a few crashes, we'd file anything looking interesting, and then, then we could go back and, um, identif uh, and investigate these crashes in a lot more detail like later. We wrote some automation as well for doing um, automating triage of Sysbot. So Sysbot is Google's, um, uh, Sysbot's Google's dashboard for syscaller and it allows them to manage different syscaller, in, uh, uh, different syscaller nodes and provide a dashboard with all the crashes in. It also does things like emailing developers um, when a bug is found and, um, and then they can investigate the crash and triage it and so on. But we noticed that um, the sysbot bugs, like they're not always, they're not always actioned. Like maybe the developers are too busy. Maybe they don't realize that it's a, um, like a security relevant issue or it just gets put on in the backlog and never looked at. Um, so we started looking through those and this gives like a good indication of, of areas to look at as well because we can see from uh, Google fuzzing at scale and us fuzzing as well um, what, what the kind of vulnerable areas could be due to like bug clustering. Um, so this is useful for KCDF. I think this is one of the reasons Google are possibly running KCDF uh, to incentivize people looking at these crashes and to reduce the amount of end days just sitting there in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the SysBot dashboards. Um, and also possibly pwn to own as well because, I mean, are these an O-Day? It's debatable, but if the developers aren't action in them, if the developers aren't aware of them, then maybe it is an O-Day. Um, the... So we wrote, we wrote some Python scripts to basically pull down the different crashes, uh, do filtering of, of looking for specific types of bug class. So use after freeze, out of bounds, writes, the kind of things which we know which are very likely to be exploitable. Um, and then we, when we, we run um, them against Ubuntu as well, like a KA sign build of Ubuntu to triage whether it affects them or not. The, um, so what vulnerabilities do we actually find? Well, the, we've, yeah, as I was saying, we found it through Syscola, uh, and this run we basically found, we found three vulnerabilities. We found two vulnerabilities which were uh, with reproducible test cases, with, with actual yeah, tests which we could, we could run and uh, reproduce the issue. So one was a heap overflow in uh, legacy palm, uh, parse parameters, which we wrote an exploit for. Um, but we, another, another team actually, they, they exploited this issue for KCTF and beat us to that one. Um, and then we also found an out-of-bounds right in WatchGuard subsystem, uh, which I think John Horn also found. Um, and uh, we wrote, well, we exploited that as far as getting a KSLR leak. Um, but the third one we're gonna talk about today is one of the issues which wasn't reproducible. Like there was no test case to actually reproduce this from Syscaller. And we had to manually triage this to determine um, the root cause of the issue. And this meant that we didn't get duped by any of the teams as well, so. Um, so this issue, it was, it, it exhibited itself as, in the, in the KSN output, it was a use after free in NF tables bind set. Um, it was a use after free write, a write of eight bytes to the, to the freed uh, chunk. And, uh, so triaging it, we were basically, we started off by looking at the alloc to see where, where the, um, and we could see that uh, it was calling NF, NF tables new sets to create a new set, and then it was uh, allocating an expression, and then free to free the expression. And then the use after free part, we could see it was doing a, um, it was binding, it was calling NF tables uh, bind set, and essentially binding, well, it, it was doing some linked list operation uh, list add tail RCU to add 
something to the tail of, of a linked list. So we were thinking, yeah, this is possibly like a, a dangling pointer within uh, um, uh, within the, the, the list, um, yeah, the sets. So the, we basically, so how do we triage this one then? We ba there was no, there's no manual way of, of doing this. I mean, there's no automated way of doing this. We, we, again, we had to do manual analysis. Um, it just required a lot of time, understanding the source code, and looking at things like where the allocation happens, where the free happens, and where the use of free, free part occurs, and then trying to piece together, like build that mental model of actually what the bug could be. Then writing some um, like test, test cases to, to try to re-trigger the bug. And finally, we, we managed to reproduce the bug just from source code analysis and infer the, um, the vulnerability side effects from this. So an interesting thing about this bug is that, um, that Sysbot did actually find this one as well. And it was sitting within the dashboard since November 2021. Um, but no, like, I didn't see this, and I, I don't think many people are aware of this. Uh, Dukov, who was the, the guy who uh, was maintainer of the Syscaller project, um, he pointed this out after we released our blog post on, on uh, exploiting this issue. But it just goes to show like this, this lot of vendors just sitting around uh, in the uh, thing. So I'm now going to hand over to Cedric to talk about the bug itself and the techniques. OK. So the idea of, of talking about this vulnerability is just taking it as an example so we can talk about everything else. But it, so we're gonna go, not going to go into like huge details, and especially because if you're interested in this kind of uh, really huge detail, we've published a really long blog post. Uh, there is a, has been a presentation, and also other company like Theory actually uh, did their own exploitation method, so you have lots of content. But basically, uh, the idea is we, we are in an NF table, and there are lots of different objects, but the only two we are interested in are a set and an expression. And the idea is that we are only in, interested in th this kind of scenario where uh, we trigger the vulnerability. Um, the idea is we have is this set object, okay? Uh, you don't even need to understand what they are, but basically this set object has a linked list, which is called bindings, and so it's a list list, it's a linked list of expressions, okay? So at some point you can have a set that has, that has a linked list of expression. And somehow we trigger the bug, and what happens is we have, like uh, Alex was saying, we have a dangling pointer to a free chunk, and it happens to be a previously allocated expression, okay? Um, and this uh, pointer to this, uh, this dangling pointer is inside this linked list. So it can be either from um, the set itself, so the beginning of the linked list, or from another expression in the linked list. And basically, like Alex was saying, uh, the user, user after free occurs when we try to insert or uh, remove an, uh, another expression from the linked list. Because the operation to insert or remove uh, an element, if you're familiar with a linked list, is basically to update pointers. And so it's going to basically write a pointer into uh, an adjacent chunk. But basically, in the other scenario we can think of is, yeah, there is already an expression in the linked list. And so in, in, in this case, the dangling pointer is not um, from the actual set itself, but it will be actually from another expression. And so we have this dangling pointer to a free chunk uh, inside an expression. And so what we can do is we can remove the expression uh, because we created all these objects. And when we remove this expression, it's going to actually write uh, the address of the previous element in the linked list, which in this case is the address of a set, into a free chunk. So obviously, writing uh, a pointer into a free chunk is not useful. Um, but at least we know what the primitive uh, gives us, if you want to understand the rest of this presentation. This slide is basically telling us the, the, the bug gives us a way to write a pointer into some free chunk at the moment. And it could be either the address inside a set or inside an expression. And so, sure, um, as I said, uh, writing a free chunk is useless. So we, we want to be able to replace that free chunk with some other object we control. And then uh, we trigger the, the limited write primitive. We, we override the pointer inside that chunk, which is not free anymore. And we corrupt a, a potential object. And so here, there are, it's basically the same kind of thing that you have to, to, to do. Is basically either you use that to uh, write a pointer that you leak back to userland, or you corrupt something else, uh, undetermined for now. 
uh, which is going to be another, uh, in another object, and you are trying to improve your privileges to something bigger than just a right primitive of a pointer. And so, yeah, we're going to use both. Um, this is kind of the summary of the exploits uh, from the high-level perspective, and so it's, it's going to basically be useful to explain all the different concepts in the rest of the presentation. But basically, from a high-level perspective, we use four use-after-freeze, which can be a lot. Uh, but basically, the limited use-after-freeze, the one I've just presented, we use it twice. Once to overwrite some object and then leak it back to userland so we, get, we can leak uh, some objects uh, from, uh, in the kernel. Another one to actually get a better primitive. So in our case, we're going to corrupt a pointer, and then we're going to be, be able to free a legitimate set. Uh, and then once we have done that, we can replace the set and, and just use after free the set as, ma as many times as we want, uh, and just uh, interact with the set from user and, and maybe abuse the, the, the fact that we control the fields of the set structure. And so in our case, we just needed it to, to do the use after free on the sets twice, uh, once to bypass kernel SLR and kernel pointers, and another one to trigger, to kick off a grub, grub gadget in order to write uh, the mod prop path and then get a root shell. So yeah, four use after freeze. Uh, so we had a couple of options for the demo. Either we do it live uh, or, the, or it can fail. Either we do it uh, as a video, it can fail, or we do it static. So hopefully it doesn't fail. Uh, but basically, the idea is I want you to see that there are four stages. Uh, the first stage is we uh, do the limited uh, use after free to leak uh, a, a, a pointer, which is the address of a set. Um, uh, we have two sets, set one and set two, so we leak the address of set one. In stage two, we, we use a second set, set two, in order to corrupt uh, a pointer into a C group object. And then once we've done that, we can basically uh, use after free a, a set because we control the fields, and we use it once to bypass a kernel SLR. And then on stage four, we use it to kick off the rub gadget. And um, yeah, we are brutes. Okay. So now we know um, an example of vulnerability um, to we have exploited. Let's talk about the general things we have to deal with for any bug. Um, in this case, we want to be able to uh, spray small objects to replace the expression. We want to be able to replace large objects because set uh, in the use after three, three and four are large objects, so we need to um, uh, control the, the, the content. And also, we're going to show how we can abuse the set structure because in, in our case, we chose to uh, use after free a set as a good primitive because, as we can see, it's going to be uh, uh, quite powerful. So I'm just going to start from the end, which is basically assuming we can corrupt a set. And so in this uh, image, we have two sets, uh, set one and set two. But actually, set two has been, used after, has been uh, corrupted. We were able to free it with our primitive and then replace all its fields. So we, cal we called it fake set because it's a fake set content. But actually, it's a real set from the operating system point of view, so we can interact with it. It's just we control the fields. And so what can we do with that? Uh, basically, um, the most important fields are the U data and UD length. Basically, in a set, you can actually, uh, at creation time, you can actually control some data that's going to be stored inside the set. So it's going to be appended uh, after the actual set structures structure, and so uh, it's basically user supply data, and you can not only uh, uh, write them uh, at creation time, but you can also read them back, which, can, which is going to be quite handy. Uh, the other thing is um, if we can actually leak, so, so yeah, so what we do is basically we, we corrupt, you'd, assuming we have leaked the, the address of set one already, um, which we do in, in phase one, uh, we can actually corrupt U data and UD length to point to set one because we know this address. And then what we can do is we can leak all the content of set one, which is uh, the first thing, but we can also potentially uh, leak the adjacent chunks as well uh, because we can set UD lengths to be not only the size of set one, but also adjacent chunks. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but we have a few constraints. Uh, for example, the name of this fake set needs to be a valid kernel pointer to a string because in order to interact with it from userland, it needs to be valid. So, but it's not a problem because we can pre preliminary, preliminary, pre preliminary allocate, when we set set one, we can store a fake name into its user data, and once we have leaked the address of set one anyway that we need for writing new data, we can just set the name to the right offset. Um, the other thing uh, we can do from leaking set one is we can leak a pointer into the list 
uh, and, uh, a linked list, which is at the first element. It's a list of uh, sets that are associated with the same table. So if we have set one and set two into the same linked list, we can just leak the address of set two, and then it gives us more uh, power. Um, and the last thing is uh, the set structure actually has uh, a pointer to a function table called ops, which we can potentially use uh, for uh, kicking uh, off a ROP chain, because there is no CFI. OK, so how do we actually uh, overwrite uh, a set? We, I said it's a large structure, so for user f 3 3 and 4, um, we need large objects. But we also want uh, other objects that are large that will be on the same uh, slab, cache, uh, in order to bypass CAS, can I, SLR that would actually contain uh, pointers to the kernel. So th this table, I'm not going to go over all the techniques, uh, because there have been many exposed, but it's just to show that basically techniques evolve over time. and Vulnerabilities take uh, always the same technique until they are dead. And that, for instance, uh, I'm showing that message message used to be a technique that had been used many, many times, but it, um, it stopped working from the exploitation point of view because the, the object ended up moving to a different cache that is not uh, uh, useful anymore in the, in the general cache because they, they are in the KMLOC NG instead of KMLOC caches. Another example is user for d where uh, by default um, in um, some distribution, they will basically uh, disable the fact that you can actually interact with user 4D from an unprivileged normal user. Uh, but the, I mean, I'm not listing them all. There are many other techniques. But the idea is, for instance, here in our case, we can actually use setx attributes um, in order to control the data um, of allocation of large size uh, in the kernel. Um, because we, all we need to do is create unprivileged user and mount NAND spaces. So that works to replace the set content. And then we need specific objects that contain kernel pointers. And we can use TTY struct uh, object because they, con they contain a pointer to the kernel. Um, however, they are in the KMLOC 1K. So and our set initially are in the KMLOC 512. But all we need is just to add data into the, the actual set to increase the size so we, we end up being on the right set, on the right cache. OK, one interesting thing about this uh, leak we've used, which could be applied to any other leak technique, is basically when we spray um, TTY struct and we allocate the set, uh, the idea is we want the set to be before other TTY struct. But what could happen, in, like in the image, is that the set is actually at the end of a slab. And so if we try to leak the content of set one and try to leak the content after set one, we're not going to leak anything because it's going to be uh, no, not, not a slab uh, being allocated yet. And so um, it's going to be annoying because uh, it means um, we can't bypass, uh, we can't get this address which we need in the first place. But the interesting thing is that we actually leak the address of set one in the first use after three. So from our perspective, what we can do is we can just check the last few bytes of the, of the address of the set we've leaked, and we can detect if it's actually at the end of a slab. And you just do some math, uh, depending on how many objects there is in the slab and, and what is the size of that object. And you can just detect that, which is quite handy. And it's, it's, it's an important reliability aspect, because it means we only need to trigger one user after three. And then we can just uh, restart the exploit from scratch uh, instead of triggering four user after threes and detecting that afterwards. So the other thing we need is we need to be able to spray small objects in order to initially replace the expression for the limited user to free for user to free one and two. And in this case, um, what matters is very specific to our, our, vulnerability, our vulnerability, which is that the uh, right primitive we have is dictated by where by the offset or where bindings, uh, the field name bindings, is in the expression structure. And so for instance, it's going to be into the object is going to be into KMLOC 96. And for instance, the prev field will be at offset 72. And so, again, I'm not listing all the objects, but the idea is, for instance, we can use uh, the, the key user key payload structure, which has been abused, which has been abused many times. And the idea is, it's usable because uh, this, st this st structure can have um, arbitrary, not arbitrary, but um, you can change the size by uh, by uh, appending different uh, data to 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 the object, but it has a, a specific header of 24 bytes. So if the offset we wanted to write was in the 24 bytes, it would be useless. But because it's in the, in the actual data, like payload of the structure, we can overwrite this payload, and then we can read it back to, from New Zealand uh, to New Zealand. So it's, it allows us to leak the kernel pointer initially for set one. 
And the other thing we need is we need um, to corrupt, uh, to get a better primitive than this limited user after free. So we need to find an object uh, with, a, uh, uh, with a, an interesting pointer at uh, offset, for example, 72, that we can corrupt and then abuse somehow. So this is kind of very specific to this bug. So we need to find new things, right? We can't find it. So here, uh, CodeQL is very good for this kind of thing. If you have to deal with this kind of um, challenge, the idea is you can ask uh, CodeQL to say, I want to find uh, objects allocated with uh, kmalloc, like structures allocated with kmalloc uh, in the kmalloc family, and that allocate into a chunk between, for instance, 64 and 96 bytes. And I want that at offset 72, there is a pointer. So obviously, you may have lots of false positive things you can't allocate from userland or whatever. But for instance, we found this C group structure that uh, is allocated on kmalloc 96, and that has, has a a character pointer called release agent at offset 72. So that matched the first uh, thing we need. But we also need to be able to allocate it from userlearn. And so what we do basically is we check it's, um, you can actually allocate it uh, from userlearn with FS open. We can free it from um, uh, userlearn with close. And by closing the C group, uh, what's going to happen, as you can imagine, it's going to free all the element of the, the object and it's going to free the release agent. Uh, so it gives us basically an, uh, a way to free a pointer. So here, uh, go, going back to the, 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 the scenario, we, we are able to free a pointer. And so in our case, it means we are able to free a pointer to a bindings, like the address of bindings into either an expression on a set. And so here, basically, what, what matters is that it's going to actually take this address and it's going to create a, a free chunk that's going to overlap. So in the case of the ex expression, because the bindings element is at the end of the, the, the actual object, it's going to actually create a, a free chunk um, and overlapping a lot for the, to the adjacent um, uh, chunk, which is not ideal because we don't know what's behind. And, and we're not going to control, if we re replace the expression, we're not going to control the actual object. But in the case of the set, it's only at offset 16, so 10 hex. And the set expression we've seen is a really big um, structure, so we're going to be able to corrupt most of the fields, abuse it like I've explained before, and, and we're not going to corrupt um, a lot uh, in the adjacent chunk. So that's good. So we're going to focus on the set. So just going back to the scenario initially where we trigger the bug, we have a, a, a dangling pointer to a free chunk uh, what we, uh, in, the, in the expression. What we do is we replace the free chunk with a C group, uh, the, the object we found with CodeQL. This, uh, this object has a release agent uh, pointer at the right offset. Now we free the expression. It's going to actually corrupt the release agent with the address of the bindings. In our case, the, the set to bindings address. And now what we can do is we can just free the C group, and it's going to actually free set two. And now we, we can replace set two and have arbitrary content and control its fields and abuse the, the fact that it's, um, in, it's a it's control set that we can interact with it from using it. So one thing um, to take into account when we trigger use after free is that it, the time you need to actually, between the free and the, the capability to replace the chunk before uh, something else on the system actually replaces the chunk. And it's something you have to deal with all the time with use after free vulnerabilities. And so in our case, the interesting thing is that we have different environments, QMU, VMware, whatever. And, and basically, uh, one of us was using VMware. And it kept crashing, but not on the other one in QMU. And it turned out it was because um, of the combination of a debug message being printed from userland that would trigger uh, handling uh, by the VMware graphic driver. You can see VMWGFX. And the, the crash happens because the, the, the chunk is, re is overwritten, like the, 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 the chunk handled by VMware graphic driver is overwritten with our, our, our pointer and it, everything. It doesn't like it. OK, so now let's move to debugging tools. So we want to talk about two things. Uh, one thing, one aspect, which is how to use the debugger to help us assist, um, assisting us with uh, debugging different user after freeze, because we have four of them. Uh, and then um, talking about libslab, like a heap analysis tool we wrote. So the thing about we have four user after freeze. So if we uh, have to debug uh, user after freeze three and four, and at first when we poke the exploit, user after free one and two are not very reliable. It's, it can be annoying to just keeping having to uh, execute the exploits and, and it fails on use after free one and you want to work on use after free three or four. So what th basically the thing you do is you just write a GDB script that's going to log the address of set one and set two at set creation with the NF table new set 
function. And then later, when you try to interact, for instance, with set two, we just assume we corrupted set two uh, by just pointing the U data uh, point, uh, pointer to set one, uh, UD length to be a bit large size, more than set one, and then timeout to be a value that you can uh, in, uh, check from userland and say, okay, we assume now it's, we corrupted the set and we just work on the rest and, and make sure it works. And it can be very handy, especially when we are several people working on the same thing. We can work on different aspects. And then the same thing for um, um, if we want to simulate all the, the, the user after free, you just want to kick off the rub chain and just debug the rub chain to make sure you're understanding it correct. Okay, so let's talk about LibSlub. Um, so LibSlub is a Python library we wrote. It's a GDB uh, Python library. Um, and the idea is we want to be analyzing the, the slab management structures as well as the object allocation. It's currently designed for GDB, but if you want to uh, adapt it for LLDB, for instance, it's really easy to do. It's open source. We've just uh, released it today uh, on GitHub. And the idea is it has to be very customizable, which is that it's going to print as much as you want if you want to parse everything. Uh, but also you are able to uh, pass certain flags and then it just prints uh, only certain parts. And we want it to be fast and we cache not only the slab structures and object addresses, so if you're in a breakpoint, you, uh, you don't have to always pass all the structures all the time and it's, it's fast. There is another pl uh, plugin uh, called SlabDBG, which is kind of similar, but it has we have different uh, ways of doing things. Um, so one thing I want, I want to say that by developing this plugin, we learned a lot about this slab internal. And it's important, I, we think, from a long-term perspective, where sure, for this vulnerability, we had certain, things, certain challenges to solve. But for another vulnerability you've seen this morning, it's always the same thing, slab cache. Um, you have to deal with for, um, for different bugs. And so the slab allocator uh, is the generic term. It's, you have several implementation into the Linux kernel, slab, slab, slab. But basically, slab is the latest one on the latest desktop uh, kernel uh, implementation. So we're just going to talk about this slab implementation. And so basically, what you, if you're not familiar with um, kernel uh, heap, I know we've talked about it um, um, already today, but because we're going to talk about the plugin, I just want to make sure everyone is on the same page. We have the concept of cache that contains slabs, and then slabs contain basically object in memory regions. And so the cache is uh, the con this concept of object all of the same type kind of thing. So kmalloc 1k will be object of size 1k, 1024 bytes. And so this cache will contain several slabs, and you have different slabs that you have to deal with. You have the main slab, what we call the main slab, which is basically the current slab that is used for the allocation. And then you have this concept of partial slab that contain allocated object, but also not allocated object. And the idea is when the main slab becomes full, because there is no room anymore, and we can't allocate new objects from this slab, um, um, partial slabs can become the, the new main slab. And you have this concept of full slab, which is basically not used at all, because they are full. Uh, they contain only allocated object. And so, yeah, it was mentioned this morning, but main slab and, and partial slabs um, are associated with a CPU core, uh, whereas a full slab is not. So it's important to understand that sometimes um, if, you are, if you are in a multi-CPU scenario. And then the slab is composed of what we call memory pages, which uh, the number of memory pages for a given slab depends on the object size and, and so on. So, okay, so going into libslab. So this is kind of the output you would get from libslab. Um, all the commands start with uh, sb, like slub, uh, and then you can do sb help to get all the commands. And the idea is you would be able to list all the slab with sb list, and then you would be able to filter with using dash k, for instance, to just filter all the kmalloc uh, uh, caches just because they are very interesting from an exploitation point of view. And you can filter with specific patterns. Um, then the sb cache is like the generic um, like overwhelming command that's going to print uh, the contents by passing all the structures. So we do print like all the different structures. You don't really need to understand them, but if you if you want to really understand the internal, it's useful. But basically, the idea is we what is useful here is that we have the you can see the free list, um, which is a pointer to to the first element in the list, and then we print that we have five elements. So we already passed uh, the free list to print it. Um, and then we see the region, so we see the first object will be at, at, at address ending with 1C00 at the bottom, and it has 16 elements. And then you can, obviously, we can print more stuff by um, uh, having more verbosity just to print the region, uh, to print the element of the free list, or also to hide the structures if we're not interested in these. 
Um, so one thing that is um, useful to know about the slab as well is you have this concept of lockless free list and regular free list, which people don't always talk about. But basically, each CPU, as I said, has a dedicated main slab. But the main slab actually has two free lists, which, if you think about it, makes sense. But uh, the idea is you have, um, because it's associated with, uh, because the, the, the main slab is associated with one CPU, and if several CPUs were actually freeing object or allocated object, you don't want um, them to, um, to mess up with the same free list at the same time, or you would need a lock, and then it would be inefficient. And so the main slab that is associated with the CPU, this particular CPU will have a dedicated free list, which, we, which is called lockless free list, and it's going to use this free list for allocating and freeing object. And all the other uh, CPUs will never use this um, main slab for uh, allocation, but if they free a chunk that happened to be from this main slab, they will be put into another free list. So there is no uh, problem of lock. Uh, there is no problem of, of racing. And, and, ob and, and obviously, this other free list, you need uh, a locking. Uh, so in this case, for instance, we just showed um, the, the output by just printing the lockless free list and the regular free list uh, without all the, the other things. The other thing um, I want to talk about is the fact that uh, sometimes really understanding the internals helps with uh, improving user after free scenarios. Because um, if you think about the fact that I've just explained that the main uh, uh, cache uh, is associated with one CPU, if you think about a scenario where it only has one free chunk remaining in the, in the main slab, and the main slab um, 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 becomes full, uh, suddenly, basically, what's going to happen is the main slab is going to change. And so if you're in a scenario where you're trying to trigger use after free and you want to replace a chunk, it's, it's adding another layer where it's, it's going to make it less reliable because the main slab changes completely. Even if you have a free chunk that gets replaced by something else that, does, that gets refreed again and you want to replace it again by your allocation, it's never going to happen because the main slab completely changed and there is no way it's going to work. So the idea is that we want to defragment the cache. Uh, the way we do that, we allocate lots of objects. For example, here we just use C group, but you can use any, any object you want. And then you just free the number of elements into a, that you know they're going to be into the slab, and you increase the likelihood that they're going to be lots of free chunk into the lockless free list, and that the main slab will remain the same during the, your, your operation. The other thing we wanted to support in the tool is a way to execute commands um, in, um, for every of, all of the objects uh, of, of the system. Um, and so the idea is we, we can execute a GDB command for all of the objects. And so we can, again, use the SB cache command, but any command will work. Uh, and for instance, in this scenario, we said, oh, print uh, the object as if it was a TTY struct and print the ops field. And so we can see that some of them have the PTY Unix 98 ops field, which indicate that they were indeed TTI structure. And so it's useful if you, don't, if you want to do something and you, 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 you crash, and after the fact, you want to, to, to parse the, the layout and see what is in, in memory. So another thing we wanted to support is I want, wanted to support the fact that we wanted to be able to tag objects uh, to say they are of a, of a certain type. So if you think about having a, a, um, a breakpoint on, for example, the allocation of TTY structure, um, um, obj structures, and, and we can just say add uh, that these objects are the, the ta we tag them as, as being TTY, and then later when we use any of the commands, um, basically the, and we want to show the tag, we'll be able to see where they are in memory, which can be quite handy. Okay, the last thing we wanted to be able to do is we wanted to be able to track full slabs. And the slab allocator doesn't need to track full slab because they're, gonna be, they're not going to be used by a new allocation, so they don't only track partial slab and, and um, main slab. Uh, but basically, from an exploitation point of view, it's very useful to be able to track full slab because usually we spray objects, we want an object uh, between other objects, and then it, be it becomes full because that's, we want to make it reliable, but then we can't find it easily. Uh, so there are two methods to actually track full slabs that we found. Uh, basically, the first one is to actually set breakpoints on slab functions and just tracking when the slabs are allocated or freed. Um, but the problem is um, it, this, this triggers all the time and GDB sometimes crashes. So this is kind of annoying sometimes to deal with this problem. Uh, the other pr method is to just log uh, the object addresses and the associated slab um, by setting a breakpoint on only the object we are interested in. 
Um, the advantage is um, it doesn't crash. Uh, the, the drawback is it's not going to log all the full slab, but generally all you're interested in is, is the, the object you're dealing with anyway, so that works. And so, for instance, here we can see that we, we tagged the set and the TTY, and, and we see that our set ended up uh, being uh, in a good layout b before TTY. The last thing it helps with is uh, the scenario where we trigger user after free, and we... And we uh, and when we reuse the, the, the chunk, uh, we realize that the object hasn't been replaced um, like we wanted. And so basically what we want is, we want, for instance, to, to spray a key to replace the field expression. It doesn't work, and we use libslub to, to find why. Um, so for instance, here we are allocating, um, we had allocated an expression at uh, offset AA that ends with offset AAE0. It was freed. So we can see with libslub it was added to the lockless free list. Uh, obviously at the head of the list, uh, on top. And then later, when we allocate the key, we realize it's uh, A7E0, so it's actually we're missing six uh, chunks, which is really bad, because it means we'll never have good reliability. And so here the idea is we can basically uh, know the address of the previous element in the linked list, and we can investigate what are these objects and try to find why and how to improve the reliability. Thanks. So moving more into reliability and scalability. Um, so this is really important for us because we're, we're um, yeah, we need to increase the, the UAF success rate. We also need to backport the exploit to older versions, and we're going to talk about some tooling which we've developed to, um, to actually do this. So as Cedric was saying, we exploited four different use after freeze. That, um, well, four, four of the same use after free, but, um, but multiple times. And the, that can introduce a system like instability because we need to reallocate this free chunk with uh, some controlled data before the system can actually, um, like before some system allocation can occur and take that uh, and take the free chunk. So Kyle from uh, ASU, he wrote a really great research paper and it, which, which uh, came up with this concept of context conservation I'd not heard of this before, but essentially it was a way he, um, he developed where basically it's a way of reducing the likelihood of a context switch occurring. And if you can make it so that, um, that your exploit uh, like uh, freeze and reallocations occur within, within a, a time slice, then it's um, more likely that, um, that the system isn't going to uh, take the, uh, the freed chunk before you have a chance to reallocate it. So he does this by, by injecting a stub into the process and to measure when a, t a fresh time slice is, uh, can be allocated and then you can perform the exploit critical functions within that time slice. The, we, also did some certain thing, we also did some things like uh, we basically reduced the amount of code between the free and the allocation because if we've got things like, um, so well, doing things like inlining functions it can uh, reduce the amount, like uh, potentially make it so that it's less likely for a context switch to occur, um, and reducing uh, unwanted debug code as well. So if there's like a debug statement in, maybe that can uh, like uh, cause unwanted memory uh, allocations to occur. We also implemented CPU pinning as well, which um, so we obviously get, we had to pin our uh, um, exploit uh, well when we trigger the bug and the reallocation. Um, on the, to happen on the same CPU cores as well. Um, so the same uh, slab cache is used. And, um, so overall, we, we, got the, we actually got our exploit down to be about 100% success, success rate overall. We got it, um, like we had, to, we had to sometimes trigger the UAFs multiple times, but we, we got to the, to the point where we weren't causing any uh, system instability and being able to not panic the, um, the systems. Um, so while we were, we were also um, trying to uh, test our exploit at the same time. Uh, well, after we'd done this, we were testing our exploit. Um, th so the Linux kernel developers, they knew which, uh, which, which, the which uh, commit the vulnerability was introduced in. But, and they said it went back as, as far as the Linux kernel 4.9. But we were a bit unsure about that because the code had changed quite a lot between 4.9 and, the, and the, uh, the latest uh, master. 
So we, we basically used syscall to create image again, just a quick way to spin up a KA sign image uh, to test the bug and to test our, our trigger to see if we could uh, trigger the bug and confirm if it was there or not. But we actually realized when we went back to 5.10 that the code had changed um, in NetFilter, but our vulnerability was still there. It's just our, our exploit wouldn't trigger the actual vulnerable code path and we need modified uh, to trigger it. Um, and we went back as, as far as 5.6, and then we were like, okay, well, NFT set alloc expression is missing, so it's unlikely that we can exploit it in this. And we worked out, and we, we ironed out some problems with our exploit, um, which we were gonna give to consultants. So things like if it's missing fuse support, then we won't be able to use our, our, our techniques. And obviously if it's missing unprivileged namespaces as well, then we won't be able to trigger our bug. Um, so the Linux developers, they were backporting the fix to, uh, to the older versions at the same time as we were backporting our exploit. They were, um, yeah, and they, they went back and ported the fix to 4.9. Uh, and we were, we were manually, but while we were doing this, we were manually hunting all the offsets, which is pretty tedious, like going through, built, um, like looking uh, in IDA or looking and, uh, and to work out what, um, what symbol offsets and struct offsets and so on, which we need. Um, but just like a, a small diversion, it's interesting to look at the, the disclosure timeline as well from an attacker perspective. Um, it's quite a complex process, patching a Linux kernel bug. Like it gets pushed, this one got uh, committed to the net dev tree, then it got merged in the BPF tree, then it got merged in the Linus tree, and then it finally uh, was like in the, uh, like the, the Linux main line. Then all of the, um, the, the actual downstream distributions need to pick up the fixes. Uh, the fixes need, needed backported, as I said, but then the fixes initially uh, they wouldn't apply because the code had changed, so the developers had to rewrite the, some of the fixes to actually apply it um, correctly. And then, uh, yeah, finally gets, it gets pushed out to the consumer. And, uh, yeah, and for some reason, Red Hat Enterprise Linux was like the last one to patch, like a commercial one. But Ubuntu and Fedora patch relatively quickly. <laughs> yeah, um, so anyway, what, that was a bit tedious, like manually doing stuff, so we, we need to improve this. So we developed a set of tools for automation and creation of testing environments. Because um, the software and kernel versions and so on which are installed in, in target environments can be quite, uh, can vary substantially. Um, and because memory corruption uh, exploits that can often contain like static offsets, then we basically had to uh, automate this. So we defined this, we created a tool called target mob and defined a vocabulary. Um, this is basically allowing us to, to do automation of QMU, Docker. Um, we can do different Linux distributions, the release, the architecture, so all the different architectures which QMU support. And we can say our target environment needs to have these specific packages installed or versions of the Linux kernel. Um, so we split our architecture for this into two different components. We have the mining pipeline, which is essentially like static binary work, so it crawls packages, extracts offsets and symbols, uh, and so on. And then we have the testing pipeline, which actually builds the environments, tests our exploit in the environments, and gives us results. So the mining pipeline, this looks like this. We basically define a project configuration, um, which is like the packages which we want installed in the environment. Then we scrape, we gather the, the package information, scrape the package information from the APIs if they're provided uh, by the distribution. And then we can do things like generating ROP gadgets, structure sizes and so on for the different kernel versions. And then finally our exploit specific project extraction. So the project extraction for each of our exploits, we, we write a JSON file which defines the offsets which we're interested in. Um, so the, the symbol offsets, the structure offsets which we care about. And then based on this, we can generate um, like all the offsets for the different releases of the, of the, of the kernel, uh, which we care about, and integrate that into our exploit. So as you can see, here's the, the symbol offsets and the structure offsets. Um, then from the testing perspective, we basically, we, have, uh, we build the image, so we build our QMU image, we run the image, and we deploy our exploit to the image. We, we've developed this notion of exploit profilers, 
where we, we execute our exploit underneath a pro, uh, with a profiler and then analyze the results. So this is good because we can basically say, okay, we need to build all the Linux 5.13.0 and like star for wildcard and basically, and then we can build all of the 5.13.0 environments. So here is just an example of 30 different buildable environments which, we're, which we've got with the, with the different kernel versions in. Then we, uh, our profilers, we, can, we, we implement an exploit profiler and that basically profiles the execution of the exploit, determines whether the exploit is successful or not. If the exploit isn't successful, we can um, gather heuristics and, and like say like heap information or, or, or figure out why the or, or, uh, stack traces and so on and figure out why our exploits has failed um, and help us analyze it. Um, yeah, and, but to do this, we need to define like a standardized interface for all our exploits to follow to actually um, to, to work with this. And then finally, um, this is just a demonstration of the kernel profiler uh, running. So we're, we're running uh, this profiler against 5.13.0.19.19 environment. This will basically download the, and install the, the, desire, the desired kernel, reboot into the image, uh, copy the exploit up, execute the exploit, gather results and determine if it's successful or not. And that's an example of the exploit profiler running, just uh, showing like uh, ID first as a low privilege user, executing the exploit, which we called Settler, and uh, given us a return code of 100, which is exploit successful. And then we can scale this up across lots of different target environments. So in con conclusion, I just wanted to say there's, there's a lot more to uh, exploit writing than just proof of concepts, uh, like especially if you have to target lots and lots of different environments. And uh, yeah, uh, and we think that the, like, the tooling and automation is really important. Like, because you want tools which you can reuse, especially if you're developing like lots of, lots of say, Linux kernel exploits, then you can um, build a scalable process for, the, for these tools. Um, I would have liked to have talked about defensive thoughts, but it's an offensive security conference, so nobody really cares. But, the, um, the, but basically, I think patching al alone is, is not really enough. Um, there's the, the attack surface of the Linux kernel is pretty huge. The, the code's changing all the time. You, you can see there's end days and things just already sitting out in the public, which people can write exploits for. I think the only way really is to do uh, attack surface reduction, and to and to reduce the, um, yeah, to reduce the the attack surfaces which an attacker has to look at. So things like Firecracker, Gvisor, um, NSJL, and things like that are, 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 are will be good research areas in future. Um, because they are going to prevent a lot of the uh, like uh, Linux kernel exploits in their current state as they are without um, specific uh, like firecracker bugs or Gvisor bugs. So in uh, uh, so we're going to release the code um, libs libslub. It's now available on GitHub, so you can clone that now. We created an exploit mitigation repository, and um, where we're trying to track uh, different exploit mitigations across the different platforms. It would be good to get more contributions there because crowdsourcing the exploit mitigations, because there's a lot of exploit mitigations out there. And we may release target mob as well at a later stage if there's interest in, in us releasing these tools as well. So yeah, thank you very much.